Welcome to In the News for the very last day of 2021. It is December the 31st, the very last day. I am Brett Birdie from AppsInLaw.com. This is Jeff Richardson from iPhone JD. Happy New Year's Eve, Brett. Happy New Year's Eve, Jeff. It is, um, it is, uh, wow, what a year. Okay, <laughs> but before we look forward into 2022 and beyond, I loved your first paragraph that I want to look backwards just for for a few minutes uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, You wrote this was 25 years ago, about this week or so, that Apple purchased Next, N-E, capital X, capital T. This was a company that I'm actually, the reason I'm so excited about this, because I would have, I would have previously put this as a blip of a footnote in the (laughs) annals of tech history, Jeff, except for the fact that over this week, I've been reading the Becoming Steve Jobs book, which was, uh, it's by Brent Schlender. He's a, he used to, he was a uh, a journalist for Fortune Magazine and several others. And this is exactly the place in the book, Jeff, where I am at right now. (laughs) And I didn't usually, I didn't usually think too much about this, but Jeff, just quickly, realizing uh, Steve Jobs left Apple in a huff and started next, right? He was going to like revolutionize. Well, technically the he was industry. fired, but yeah, yeah. True, the fired true. Him, yeah, okay. But, but I'm sure <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt because I'm <laughs> sure he saw it a little bit different, but, but Jeff, just quickly, the thing that got me in right at this time was how close both next and Apple were basically to imploding upon themselves. I mean, yeah. both companies were almost in bankruptcy. And you had a couple of excellent articles that you linked to today where, you know, saying that this was the anniversary where Apple purchased next. You could probably give a little bit more background on this too. It was just such a significant thing. I mean, Apple, it, so many reports have revealed after the fact. I mean, we knew at the time Apple was in trouble. There was a famous front cover of a Wired magazine uh, that had Apple, you know, is Apple doomed? Um, but we've since oh, yeah. learned that Apple yeah. really was doomed. I mean, like they had almost no money left in the Incredible. bank. Incredible. They were about to go bankrupt. Um, at the time, they didn't know what their future was because the operating system for the Mac um, wasn't going to work. It didn't support multitasking right. or other things. And they were trying Incredible. to come up with their own version of a next version operating system called Copeland. It completely failed and they didn't know what to do. And so they were going to have to hire, they were going to have to purchase an outside operating system, which right. is crazy. Exactly. A company like Apple that's so famous for creating <laughs> its own technology was just going to have right. to buy it from someone else. There were really only two serious candidates. So there were some other possibilities. One was a company called a B, B-E, which was yes, formed by exactly. John Lee Basset, a, a former um, Apple executive. Right. Um, and then the other possibility was the next operating system, um, which was started by Steve Jobs after he left Apple. He then started right. the next company and came out. I remember when I was in college, you know, seeing these next cubes, which were super expensive and these big black boxes, yes. but they yes. looked very futuristic. They were incredibly expensive. So they were really too expensive for consumers to buy. I want to say at the time they cost like $10,000 or something like that. It was crazy. But, yeah. Um, but they were, and they were only black and white, but they were very high resolution um, for the time. But uh, let's not talk about the hardware. It was the software. <laughs> Apple yeah. uh, used something called Unix, which had been around since the 80s. It was an incredibly stable, incredibly mm-hmm. Comp- mm-hmm. sophisticated operating system that could allow multiple things to happen at one time. It was being used you know, by major, major companies to do sophisticated research. And uh, Steve Jobs and his, his uh, folks started the next operating system based upon that. And that's what Apple purchased. And so at the time, the news story was that, oh, Apple has found its next operating system. Isn't this great? Um, But of course, in reality, (laughs) that's as the title that you're showing right now, Apple acquires next comma jobs, you know, more than anything else, what Apple got was Steve Jobs back in the company. And boy, yeah. did they need it yeah. because he imposed a lot of discipline. He cut a bunch of products that were going nowhere, including yep. some that were beloved, like the Newton, and um, and put discipline back in the company. The first big product was the the new version, or it was the iMac. It was the original iMac, which was sort of the, the colorful see-through plastic that after it came out, you know, everybody was copying that see-through plastic look, and it was incredibly popular. Right. Um, but then, you know, it, it led to one thing after another, the iPad, iPod, and then the iPhone and the iPad. It it is no exaggeration to say that, but for this acquisition 25 years ago, you know, the entire world would be different today from a technology standpoint. I don't know, right. you know, we, I don't, we wouldn't have the iPhone. Maybe somebody else would have made something similar, but it's, it's just, there's no guarantee it would have all come together. Um, so, so many changes. The, uh, 
the, okay, the no one, spoilers. I'm only halfway through this book. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that I thought was interesting is one of the things that I linked was that Mac Rumors article 25 years ago today. And, yes. and it provides a link to this article, which was by uh, Steve Heyman, yeah. who is the next engineer. That's it right there on the screen for folks Look watching Look at this video. website, too. That's incredible. <laughs> Uh, but he has a quote in here where he says that, you know, in retrospect, the tech involved in the merger was, you know, was one sided, you know, and a lot of people would say that it wasn't actually that Apple bought next right. for 400, 400 million dollars. It was actually that next bought Apple for negative $400 million because yeah. even though next yeah. was the smaller company with fewer yeah. employees and, and a shorter history, when next came in, it really changed Apple. You know, he points out that just a few years later, 70% of Apple vice presidents were former next people. And that has continued almost on until today. I mean, so many of the Crazy. important uh, vice presidents and, and executives at Apple throughout the 2000s and 2010s were next people. And of course, Steve Jobs himself. So, you know, next really took over Apple. And in retrospect, it was amazing. It, it you know, saved the company <laughs> at the time. However, nobody knew if it was going to work out. Um, right. And right. It, it's, it was very, it could not be more influential. I, just reading this book, first of all, at the time, it was the dominance of Bill Gates and Microsoft. I mean, when you talk about operating systems, that's what Apple was really floundering on. We know them more as the hardware company, but it was really the software and they were just getting their lunch handed to them by Microsoft at the time. And they were in Microsoft was dominating with, I mean, that was Windows 95 when, when, when that first came out. And, and, and just looking at this book and, here, and getting some of the inside details, the Apple executives were scrambling like, okay, we're, we're at a loss. We have no idea what to do. And just like you were, you got a great memory. Like they only had a couple of options to go out and find an operating system that they could work on. And at the time you mentioned the next hardware, that was going nowhere. In fact, it was probably going negative. And the only thing that yeah. was saving the company at the time was, and, and, and this is a great article, by the way, like that you said that you linked to here. This is, is it Steve? Um, His name is Steve uh, Heyman. Heyman, yeah, okay, yeah, which which I think is, is cool. By the way, he he mentioned it. There's a picture quickly. of him down at the bottom of the article. If you want to, yeah, <laughs> something just quickly. Even though I'm interrupting myself, but he said there he is, Steve Heyman. But he says he had Steve at next.com. I think that was his email, right? <laughs> I, I just he, he was like, ask me about that some other time. Anyway, <laughs> at the time. Uh, Next wasn't known really, at least in the tech industry, for their hardware, other than the fact that it's very expensive. And Steve was trying to get some really fu funky and crazy presentations, you know, to get people interested. But it was their operating system, exactly the way you described it. And also the other thing was called web objects, mm -hmm. which is basically the foundation for what a lot of the World Wide Web is built on today. In fact, they said here in this Steve Heyman's piece that at the time they were they were touting CyberSlice, which was a revolutionary new system for the web to order pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, you know, that's what Apple said that they were purchasing at the time was the next step, I think was the name of the operating system, next step, and then the web objects as well. It, it, it just, it, the biggest other thing that I'm taking from this book, Jeff, is, is again, just how close that both Apple and Next were were to just being nothing. I mean, they were both, uh, Apple was almost going into bankruptcy. Uh, yeah. uh, the book says they had bankruptcy counsel standing oh, no. by. Like it they were like ready to left. go for it. Just fact, incredible. I want to go back to underscore something you just mentioned. Of course, it was the next step operating system, which was so important. And let me just say, yes. not only did that become the Mac operating system, but it's now the foundation of the iPhone and the uh -huh. iPad and the Apple Ooh. TV. Everything that Apple yes. makes, you can draw a line Good point. from the current operating system all the way back to next in the 90s. But you also mentioned web objects, and people don't think about it anymore. But in the 1990s, that you know, nowadays, we all take it for granted. Granted that, of course, we purchase yes. everything over the internet. Yes. We buy from Amazon and store. You know, I mean, most of us probably did most of our holiday shopping this year over the internet. Um, but in the early, in the 1990s, that stuff was really new. And having the software to yeah. be able to run a, ro a robust yeah. online store, uh, Next created its web objects system, which right. was used by so many companies. It was used by Apple for years. It, many, many companies. And no Disney one's using it anymore. Yep. It's, it's, yeah. it's no longer good technology today. But, you know, Online commerce in the 90s and 2000s, yeah, which was a, which was the, the building blocks of what we have today, would not have been the same but for this technology. So incredibly important and influential technology 
um, you know, was going on in the 90s. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to look back at 25 years ago. It was a really important time. I'm so glad you linked to these stories. It's just great. And, and I'll make sure we have these links in the show notes as well. Just the picture of this. Apparently, it was Next's website in 1996 when they announced the merger. <laughs> and I love it here. Even the web job, web objects, they say web objects sites let you order pizza, compare cars, <laughs> plan a vacation, shop for gifts and more. But like yeah. you said, how crazy revolutionary that was in 1996, Jeff. That's great. Thanks for uh, linking to that. So from looking backwards now, we can look forward. This was In fact, a great let's look other... down the road, literally. Down the road. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good one, my friend. This was, I saw this story mentioned a couple of times. Anytime that we can get some Apple executives, like high up executives to sit down for some kind of a little interview or somebody uh, uh, mentioning the story, it's, it's, it's very interesting to kind of get some, uh, some insight. So this one focuses on Apple Maps. I think this came on CNN, yes. And they talked to a couple of executives about Apple Maps and the changes they had made in 2021 and a couple of things that they're looking for down the road, as it were. Yeah. You know, the big change that they talk about here is making uh, making it three-dimensional and yes. more detail. And this has come in a couple of different waves. You know, the, when original, the Apple Maps program originally was just two-dimensional. You just, it was as if you were looking straight down from on top. And then over time, they've added uh, so that you can sort of tilt and you can actually mm -hmm. see the relative height of buildings and stuff. And Apple did a lot of that. And, and around the same time that Apple did that, they also came up with like the flyover feature of certain cities. And right. so if you want right. to, for example, my city, New Orleans, if you go to Apple Maps and you just type New Orleans, Louisiana, for your search, um, you will see on the left side of the iPad or on the middle of the iPhone, um, a card about New Orleans. And there's a button you can tap called flyover. And it will sort of give you through sort of a, uh, it's almost like you were in a helicopter flying around a city. In a, in a drone. And, right. and it only, it, it, or a drone. And it only works because Apple understands the height of the building. Um, so that, that's that been around for a few years. And then what they've done more recently is they're going back and they're adding a, an additional level of detail. And it's only in a few cities right now. Yeah, the pictures that yeah, you're showing right. on the screen for folks watching video are San Francisco, which is, of course, Apple's backyard. So they often right. you know do San Francisco yeah, maps this one up here. incredibly right. first. But it's just incredible detail. Um, so that when you're looking around things, um, you can, it just makes it much more realistic, which is not just pretty, although it is, but it's also much more helpful because as you're going around in the real world, after looking at, or at the same time that you're looking at something on your iPhone, it's much uh, easier to figure out where you are when you see these almost photorealistic, not quite, um, representations of the outside world. And it's something that for now, Apple, it's sort of one of the few things that distinguishes them from Google Maps and Waze and some of the other yes, ones out there. Right. So it's not everywhere yet. It's just in big cities. But the same was true about the three-dimensional stuff I mentioned before. And that and that spread, you know, all over the place. So this this is the future of Apple Maps. I mean, they point out that when you're in San Francisco, and I mean, not only do you see the streets, you see the name of the street on it. You can even see the crosswalks. I mean, it's incredibly realistic. So right. this is, you know, we are in a transition. You know, Apple Maps, it's not... Things don't just instantly change in Apple Maps suddenly, but they change over time. But they are they are getting better. And you know, it wasn't that long years time. ago, Brett, yes. that we all joked about Apple Maps. Ha ha ha. Absolutely. So silly. You know, why would you not use Google Maps? But nowadays, you know, Apple Maps works really, really well. I I have made myself switch to Apple Maps a few times because I feel like I'm not giving its due <laughs> Uh, uh, pref deference because I, I, I use maps constantly almost any time that I drive now plug in the iPhone and I have a CarPlay too. going and I I still go first to Google Maps I don't mm. know it now if it is something just in my brain it's like what I'm used to but you know you mentioned how we used to laugh and it was a little bit of a joke I remember whatever presentation that it was it's been several years now that Apple made the announcement that they had Apple Maps. And then either that day or maybe later, they decided, okay, well, Apple Maps and now is going to be the default maps for uh, the iPhone. In other words, I've been using, the, we've been using the iPhone long enough that Google Maps was the only map app, right? Before right. Apple originally, even had a map yeah. app. And when Apple released their maps, it was just no, it was just terrible compared to Google Maps. And I've just continued, I guess, to stay on Google Maps. I like the, the, the view. It's a little bit different if you're used to seeing Google Maps. And mm -hmm. Apple Maps, to me, looks almost a little bit, 
and I don't mean this negatively, but it looks a little more cartoonish a little bit, but that's not a bad thing. It's just, I'm having to get myself used to it a little bit. And I have seen some amazing progress on Apple maps, but man, it takes them such a long time. <laughs> it does. It does. And you know, we're now getting to the point where there are some features of Apple maps, like the graphical stuff I was just describing that I think are better than Google maps, but there, I mean, to be clear, right. there I are agree. also things in Google maps that are better. Um, we just, uh, for, uh, for Christmas last week, my wife and I took a road trip across the country with our kids. We went from new Orleans okay. all the right. way up to New York where my mother-in-law lives. Nice. In fact, we, we thought about stopping in Ohio to see you, Brett, but as you know, we didn't do that <laughs> I um, know. for a number of reasons. But, um, so we did this COVID. on the road for days and days and hundreds of miles and we used apple maps on carplay okay for our navigation and you know Nap apple maps is so good i mean when you're switching interstates it shows you what lane you want to be yeah, in. yeah i love that right? but at the same time we were also using google maps for certain things i mean a good example of it is times when my wife was driving um i was looking at uh google maps on my phone not apple maps because if you want to find for example where one of the things we we're looking for was was covid tests at pharmacies as we were driving across right. the country and google maps has a feature that once you've put in a destination you can search along the map um right. which is that apple apple offers it in a very limited way for only like a okay. couple okay. specific things like lodging and and, and restaurants and stuff Gas but it didn't yeah, have okay. one for okay. pharmacies whereas google did so it, oh, it's it's nice to have i love hmm. having these two robust products so that you can go back and forth you know if you want to see yeah. a close-up of the front of the yeah. house you're going to want to use Google Maps because of Street View. But if uh, unless it's a city that Apple has done its its version of Street View on, and then that's pretty good too because it's more realistic. I love that they're going back and forth and they're getting better. Um, that's in fair. my mind, Apple is. I think Apple is a peer of Google Maps. Some may disagree with that and say it's a step behind, but it's certainly okay. close. It's not like the old days where it was 10 steps behind. And when you read this article, you realize that I mean, they are putting a lot of resources into this and they are they are not slowing down they are they i'm are. just glad to see that one of the uh, engineers adorn is his last name i just love this very last sentence if Apple maps is doing its job right dorn says it can remove a cognitive load off of the user and let you focus on the road mm -hmm. and truly to me with carplay whether it's google maps or apple maps just having that to where i can do it at a glance or i can listen to it or frankly the other thing that google maps cannot do is integrate with my apple watch and i always right. have my watch on and i don't even sometimes have to look at the carplay or even the phone in my hand because the apple watch will tap my wrist you know it's like three taps to go right or something like that i, I have to mm -hmm. sometimes i have to remind myself but i do like the fact that I can look at it, especially if I'm walking in a in an urban areas of some kind, then the Apple Watch to me is even more useful than pulling out my my phone. So yeah. uh, good good stuff on that. I'm glad that you know you something else to added to Apple Maps just this past year through one of the iOS updates was the current version of Apple Maps can show you um, hazards on the road ahead. And when we were driving for the oh, last yeah. couple of weeks, like if there was accidents on the roads and there there were some from time to time, you now get alerts of that in Apple Maps and you can see it. That's something that didn't used to exist before. So I mean, oh, a million examples of things that they're doing to improve the product i'm just glad they're still putting resources into it absolutely they're definitely in are. addition to another thing that you and i both like of course is airpods and this was another interesting interview uh it really wasn't the inventor of the airpods but gary Geeves or jeeves is one of the mm -hmm. uh, uh the gentlemen here that he was at least very much involved at the beginning of creating or uh even i think the latest airpods 3 yeah, um, vice president of acoustics at apple is okay title. yeah which is wow like wow that's a, that's a fantastic <laughs> title there but uh, i i didn't read this in that much detail jeff but the little pieces and, and parts that i did pick up uh, my mind is blown with how much uh, how many problems how many challenges <laughs> that it comes with creating something that we just i i personally take for granted so often when i'm using my airpods yeah i mean they they think about a lot of details as you would expect that you and I may not notice, but then when you do notice it, you're like, oh, that's really cool that they, that they did that. <laughs> right. You know, one example disclosed in here is that when you're using um, AirPods Pro or the newest third generation AirPods that support spatial audio that just came out what, a couple right. months ago, um, right. if you are connecting them to an Apple TV, it will make it seem like the speaker, you know, it pretend just by pretending yeah. the things in a different space, it'll make it seem like the speakers are on one location in the room. But then when you're connected to your iPhone, which you're likely to have like a foot from your face or something, it makes makes it seem as if the speaker is even closer, which is something I had not even noticed. Crazy. But the idea that they thought about that just shows how, you know, intent they get. One more interesting thing 
thing about this article that I didn't mention in uh, in my post today was there's a part. So I forget where to show you where it is, but somewhere in here, he's asked the question about you're doing you're sending so much information back and forth yes. over Bluetooth. Isn't Bluetooth <laughs> pretty limited for how much information you can send back and forth? Uh-huh. And his answer is like we're doing everything possible we can with Bluetooth, and he come he comes so close to saying. Uh-huh. And we have something planned to come in the future that's going to give us a lot more bandwidth to do a lot more. But of course, he doesn't say it because he's not going to announce future projects. But <laughs> it really does make me wonder if a future version of Air, not even wonder, I'm, I'm going to now come out and predict based upon this that, uh, yeah, you just got it. You found that quote um, that their Apple has cooking something that was, you know, maybe yes. a superset of Bluetooth so that maybe future AirPod Pros or AirPods will support Bluetooth but they will also support like Apple's, you know, Bluetooth plus or, you know, super Bluetooth or something right. that allows a lot more data to go back and forth and then can do a lot more cool things. So if you, if you want to have a sense of what might be coming in the next, you know, one, two, three, five years for the AirPods, that little sentence that you're highlighting, um, you know, it's fair to say we would like more bandwidth and dot, dot, dot. I'll stop right there. We would yeah, like exactly. more bandwidth. We, <laughs> you know, he, he smiles. And, and then he smiles. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, it, you know it, it, it's something when I think about it as Apple, one of the things that they are doing is always pushing these bounds. I mean, Bluetooth is technology. We, we sort of, you know, take it for granted again, because it's something that we do, all deal with every day, but sure. it's been around for several decades now, right? Probably like the mid nineties. I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember. But, when Bluetooth, yeah. but it's the same thing. Like that's why Apple, everybody was upset when, when, when Apple uh, went, you know, their iPhones to a 30 pin connector and then a lightning connector, you know, we're like, what's going on. But this is the only way that they're able to push the bounds i think of of what some of the limitations are it, it, anyway to your point i think this is good it's like we'll see something soon in fact i mean you just said the 90s i actually don't think it's that far ago because i remember after hurricane katrina i was living in new york city for a while this is 2005 2006 at the time there was no iphone i was using an ipod and i remember at the time that there were some people that had bluetooth headphones but they were very expensive and they weren't used by a lot of people and so that's only what are we and that's what 16 17 years ago um right. you know i think bluetooth was around there but um oh i guess technically it was created the technology was created in 1999 but i don't think the bluetooth right. was starting to get mainstream until the mid 2000s and so in the overall I, I mean heck you and i were just talking about 25 years ago with the next acquisition bluetooth uh-huh. is not that old which makes you think that there's a lot more to be done there whether it's the next version of the bluetooth standard oh, yeah. or apple's oh, yeah. version of it so you know this is one of these things that there's going to be changes coming down the road to, to make this stuff even more sophisticated yeah. and more powerful. Good story on that. So I hope that you don't need to go and purchase any AirPods right now in a <laughs> physical Apple store, <laughs> Jeff, because I'm, I'm, I was sad to hear that your New Orleans Apple store has closed along with many, many other Apple stores. Um, yeah. I've seen this story spread out because I I was following some of the same tweets that you linked to about Apple closing various of their retail, physical retail stores in New York City, of course. And they have what? And um, uh, uh, not only that, but I don't know, there was a whole list of other states. So this is Mm, this one's listed. A couple of them in Florida. um, Right. And New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, it, when I when I saw this and you linked to it as well, I guess the one thing I was thinking of is, you know, Waffle Houses. That was <laughs> the first thing that know. occurred to me, too. Go ahead. OK, and good. That. OK, good. We're on the same wavelength then. I was thinking, you know, Waffle Houses are always what is the, the, the Waffle House index, right? right? Because you know that if the Waffle House closes in a tornado or some kind of an emergency, like it's really, really bad. Right. And it's like, to me, it's like, okay, if the Apple stores start closing, if the physical Apple stores start closing, then, you know, (laughs) COVID is probably getting pretty bad either because, well, I think in new Orleans, right. There were several of the employees there that had COVID. So they obviously shut it down for that. I know when you go into an Apple store today, you are required to wear a mask. Like they're trying to take this seriously and I'm not making light of this. It's, it's, it's terrible. And really it's just kind of, um, reflections of about a year ago or even less and it's unfortunate uh but it was just something that occurred to me as as i was looking at this and i i don't think we're done yet unfortunately i think more and more i think here in ohio at least i still we've still got some open but i don't know how many people are going right now yeah i mean it is sort of a i mean it's unfortunate for the for the people affected of course but just from sort of a, a you know a, a sociological or sort of data impact when that when the waffle house closes you know things are bad when the waffle house opens you know things are about to start to get better um and it's been true yes. throughout the pandemic as Apple stores have closed in different cities across the country, it has absolutely been a red 
flag that, hey, things are bad in this city. Um, there, there's no question there. You can one follows the other. So um, it yeah. is interesting, which, which brings you into, you know, what the what you're starting to show on the screen here, which right. is the exposure notification apps. Um, you know, I think we've talked about this in the past, but early in the pandemic, Apple and Google teamed up to allow for exposure notification as something right. that is built into the operating system, um, which was a great idea because if somebody has COVID, one of the first things you want to know is who have they been around because right. those people may right. need to get tested and quarantined. And you know, public health officials try to do contact tracing in many cases where they find out who was that person in contact with. But what I always wonder is, you know, that relies upon somebody's memory. You know, who do you remember that you were in yes, contact with? Exactly. You may forget. Yes. And the advantage of these electronic exposure notification systems is that when they work, um, your iPhone knows that your iPhone and John's iPhone were close to each other for more than 15 minutes. And so mm, therefore, John may have been exposed. But the system, you know, there's so many things that are required for the system to work, the most basic of which is for people to use the app. And so if you test positive, to actually open up the exposure app on your iPhone or on your Android and to say, hey, I tested positive. And then the app can do its magic of figuring out, you know, who you were close to and have right. those people anonymously, you know, in a way that you can't figure out who they are and they can't figure out who you are, notify those folks. Um, and, and that requires a lot of um, education. This article from the Washington Post, one mm -hmm. of the folks responsible for developing the system um, complained that there are some places like some college campuses and some parts of England where there has been a lot of um, promotion of the exposure notification systems, and it has actually made an impact on people. But in so many other places, you know, the apps exist, but nobody really mentions them. And so people don't think about it. So it hasn't has, you know, it has a lot of potential, but just because of the realities of life, it hasn't achieved that potential yet, which is unfortunate because it's a public health issue. You wrote about this back in April of 2020 mm -hmm. on the screening tool. And I got to say, I, I feel like that even though this was pretty monumental that Google and Apple worked together and several other technology companies, but I feel like I haven't heard enough about this. Like, I, yeah. I feel like they didn't, I, I don't know where the breakdown happened necessarily. Uh, I think this could have been an, an amazing tool, but you know, such as it is. And anyway, it's a great article that you link to in the Washington Post. So yeah. I mean, just you, to make it uh, personal, I mean, the, the thing that we went through for Christmas, our Christmas plans were sort of, up, up, you know, went into a tizzy because right. I had some members of my own family, not my, not my immediate family, my more extended family, who tested positive after we had gotten together. And so oh it caused the rest yeah. of us to be very nervous and try to get tests, right. which is why I was right. looking for tests with that Google Maps app. And um, unfortunately, we were all fine. But Good. one of the thoughts Good. that even my wife had asked me afterwards is she's like, you know, we never got a notification from the Apple thing. And I'm like, yeah, we didn't. And that's because my family member who tested positive, I presume that either they don't use the app or if they do have it, they didn't think right. to put in there um, anything. And so that's the thing, it, it, unless you use it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna right. help people. So um, right. I still think right. it's a good idea. I'm glad Apple has the app for the people that do use it. It could, you know, every little bit helps, every little bit helps. But, um, but so it's a, it's a fascinating Washington Post article that sort of talks about looking back on, you know, in retrospect, what a difference it did make and did not make. The next story has an element of looking forward and looking back. I feel like that's our theme for today. <laughs> Indeed, that's appropriate I saw for end this, of the year. I saw this for, from a couple of places, and I'm glad that you linked to this on Ars Technica here. This is uh, John Timmer writing about the end of the line finally coming for BlackBerry devices. Oh, my goodness. If, I feel like we've heard this before, though. <laughs> like, this isn't the first time, right? Yeah, BlackBerry. Uh, I mean, but they really, can... really mean it this time. You can still buy devices that have the word BlackBerry on them and that work with Android. But the original BlackBerry, the real one, the one that, you know, was was all but part of a lawyer's required, you know, uh, tools oh, back in the right. early 2000s. You had to have a BlackBerry. I had, a BlackBerry. had everybody, to. everybody had a BlackBerry um, that has, you know, that those days have gone away. And so although the BlackBerry <laughs> has not been relevant for a long time, boy, was it significant in the early 2000s. And so it, it is, you know, it, it's interesting for so many things. I mean, from sort of a nostalgia standpoint, it yes. also reminds you that as large and big as any company can be in any industry, you know, doesn't mean that they're going to be there forever. <laughs> so Apple, we talked earlier today about how Apple almost went away in the 1990s. Thank goodness it didn't. You know, there was a yeah. time period and when BlackBerry was, they, they were the number one smartphone, especially in business. I mean, everybody, lawyer, you know, doctor, business person, you all had it. And then, then it yeah. all went away. And now iPhone's on top and has been for a while now. Um, will it be there forever? You know, if nothing's forever in life, you know, will, will there be a day when we look back on the iPhone the same way we look back on the BlackBerry? 
who knows? Um, Don't say Apple it certainly, so. you know, Apple certainly hopes that if it happens, you know, the iPod was king until Apple itself got away. You know, they they themselves took over that market with the iPhone. Yeah. So I'm sure if yeah. Apple had its way, when the iPhone dies, it will be because Apple itself has come out with the next great thing. Who knows what that might be yet? Maybe some of the the the, the 3D stuff, the augmented reality stuff they're working on. Who knows? I remember in 2002, 2001, 2002, I was working as a practice support manager at a large law firm. Uh, we did not have any mobile devices. And I was at the time trying to say, we need to have the Palm Treo 650. Mm -hmm. But I cannot tell you how much pushback came to me, Jeff, from the people that had Blackberries. It is all about the physical keyboard. Yeah, They always yeah. wanted that physical keyboard. And at the time, there wasn't even a touch screen. Right. Mm -hmm. We had a little we had a little uh, uh, I don't know if it was a, a rollerball almost, if you remember that on there. And yeah, one of the first touch. Yeah. One of the first touchscreen Blackberries was the Blackberry uh, Storm. A torch I think it was right called. here. Torch. No, torch. Was that what the it was? first. Yep. In yeah, 2010 um, is when it came out. 2010. Yeah. So Crazy. It's, it's, it's interesting. Well, one of the things that I always enjoy every year that you do quickly, Jeff, is you go through the ABA technology survey. And here is one of your posts from 2011. And I just like to, sh to point out here on this little pie chart that in 2011, of all the lawyers surveyed, 40 percent of them were using a blackberry at the time that's and, and uh, in other words that was the majority right yeah. now fast forward to 2019 I, and iphone at the time was 31 percent. so i 31 percent, right yes. fast forward to 2019 iphone is now 79 percent, and blackberry is one percent <laughs> And that, that's <laughs> eight years later. And then take it forward eight to the most recent later. data. Yes, that, yes. That let me open this one here for you. In 2021, now uh, it's uh, BlackBerry is not even on the chart because <laughs> it's not even on the pie chart. Zero percent of lawyers are using the BlackBerry. Um, for those folks watching the video, you Incredible. can see a chart right now that sort of shows starting in 2011 through today how BlackBerry was so dominant and then just went down to nothing and the iPhone ate their lunch. And Android has sort of stayed wow. sort of in the same place the whole time right. in that 20 percent, sometimes a little bit higher, sometimes later. But the, right. you can see a direct correlation between everything that's not Android, including BlackBerry and other phones like, you know, the Windows CE phone, something like that, that all of that market share has gone to the iPhone. Um, Android has remained pretty steady as an alternative for the last uh, decade, um, but but Apple definitely uh, supplanted uh, the black the BlackBerry. That's that's amazing. I love that. All right. So one last thing that you linked to, which I just thought was was brilliant. Uh, <laughs> as all things, I won't play the whole video here, uh, but Apple now I think they owned the Peanuts. Um, Apple TV Plus, yeah. yeah. Apple TV Plus owns the Peanuts. And I, in fact, I remember there were some stories like people couldn't watch the, the the Peanuts Christmas special or something like that. Anyway, Apple made it a free or did you post about it? It was like on PBS yeah, or something. It's for on one PBS day. so that folks can right. watch it there too if you don't have Apple TV Plus. Here was a cr cute little, uh, it's a sing-along with the Peanuts King of Auld Lang Syne. And at first I thought, okay, well, this is going to be kind of slow and a little boring, but boy, it picks up right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, it's cute. So and they, they created this for linking from, to that. <laughs> I, they, I haven't watched it, but, you know, there's a new Peanuts <laughs> holiday special this year for today, for yes. New Year's Eve. Yes. And uh, in fact, I mentioned something to my wife about it. He's, he's not, near, you know, not a big technology person like I am. And when I mentioned a, a Peanuts <laughs> New Year's Eve, she's like, there's no Peanuts New Year's Eve because she, like everyone else ah. that grew up in our generation, we know all those Peanuts holiday specials. Of course. We watch them of course. a million times as kids. Right. She's like, no, no, Jeff, you're wrong. There's not one for New Year's. I'm like, well, there's, there is a <laughs> there brand is new now. one this year they just came out with. <laughs> and they took that that holiday uh, special, which I have not watched, and they have turned it into this little two-minute video with lyrics, which I have watched and is it is uh, so it's, cute. It's wonderful. I love it's watching good. it. I encourage it's good. It's good for the it. new year. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the, well, you're, the part you're showing it right now, this is just my personal bias because I'm in New Orleans and I love jazz music. But right. they've got Snoopy and a bunch of Snoopy's cousins, yeah. I guess, all doing what to me looks like sort of a New Orleans inspired brass, uh, brass it's band. It's like a second line uh, happening. Exactly. Right there. It's and, great. And, and when you, when you want to listen to the music, they sort of give a little uh, a little jazzy portion of the four all Yeah, time, I love that. Song, I love that. <laughs> Thanks for linking. Let's end 2021 now with a couple of good in the know tips for everyone. Let's do it. Let's do and it. And as part of my, I feel like I, I had to find something that would fit this uh, this uh, feeling of, of happy new year. Uh, and so I'm going to share one of my favorite to do apps. And I did a video on this and I'll, I'll show some of it here uh, in just a moment uh, because I, I, 
I've, I've tried to use all of the task management apps and to-do apps and everything, Jeff. And I know we've talked about this before. I think you're a things user. Am I correct? I, do, I use an app yeah. called Things, yes. Which, which is great. I love that. And we know Davis Sparks uses OmniFocus. I mean, that's really, really high end. But every time, and I talk about this in this little video I do, every time I find myself getting more uh, caught up in, in the, how to use the app than actually tracking the things I need to track. So I don't really think of Microsoft to do, which comes from Microsoft. And I explained it here. We used to be an app called Wonderlist. Microsoft acquired it and they've turned it into this very simple list app. And what I like about it is even though I do use it as sort of a quote task management app, I don't look at it as that. I frankly look at it as a a stress avoider app for myself. Because anytime that you have one of those things pop up in your mind, like, oh, I got to remember to do that uh, two days from now, or next week, I got to remember to make a phone call. And I hate having the stress of having to remember some of those things. And that to me is where Microsoft To Do comes in. Because what I do is I just capture it very quickly in the To Do app. And then typically I will put a quote due date on it. But the due date for me is not like that's when I got to do it. It's when that particular task will bubble up in my in my morning routine like i can look at everything that'll be the in, my, in the in the planned list it'll come up that day and then i can decide do i need to accomplish this now or do i need to uh send it on to a, the next week or so but the last the couple of quick tips i want to put in here i love is that if you use microsoft to do which by the way is free you do have to have a free microsoft account in order to use it or if you have a subscription to Microsoft 365 or something similar, you can, uh, you can use it with that as well. My first tip is that in the naming of a list, you can put a little emoji. I don't know if you can see this here, but I've got a books list here. And in that little books list, I have a little emoji stack of books. Oh, that's a clever I just, idea. I should do that. I love it I like because that. I'm quickly looking through my different lists that I have, right? Whether it's a shopping list or my workout list or hmm. any kind of a list. I like to have a little visual there. Like I like your pie charts. I like a little visual of the emoji. The second little tip that I have is when you're typing a task or a to-do inside Microsoft to-do, you could just add a little hashtag to the beginning of a word like email. Like I need to, you know, reply to John's email and I can put a hashtag in front of email. And what that does is immediately transform that word into a tag. And it's a tappable tag. <laughs> That's my own way to call it. In other words, if I have several tasks that have the hashtag email, where I put a hashtag in front of the word email, I can tap that uh, tag of email. And then all of the tasks that include that tag will pop up. In other way, it's almost like a quick way to do a search across right. mini apps. There's a built-in search inside Microsoft to do, which I feel I find works great. But sometimes I just want I use the same word a lot of times in many tasks, and I just want to tap that little tag and it's tappable. So you can just tap it and bring up all of those. So Microsoft to do is sort of my app <laughs> that it's very simple. And I explain a lot more in the video. I'll link to it so that how you can use it, because I don't need the craziness of like so much how to plan ahead. And when it comes due, you can do all of that in Microsoft to do. But I I use it mainly as a simple list. And then there's just a couple of little quick uh, tips in there that I wanted to add. Yeah, and if I could just point out, that's not unique to do because I, I use the things app. Yes, and while, while you were talking, I just true. went into one of my entries and I put an emoji like at the very beginning of the oh, entry. Oh, good. And, okay. Uh, that's great because if I, and I just did it for one, but now if I look down on my iPhone, that one sort of jumps out of me because of that emoji. So if I used right. it just because they emojis take up so little space that if right. I just came up with two or three different emojis and put them next to that, that's a great little tip that I had never thought about. Um, so oh, good. that's, that's I'm not glad. unique to Microsoft. Too. I I'm love using, using that with things. Um, right, right, right. Because it's just good. It's a little visual cue. And that's really yeah, nice. Yeah, that's all, that's all you're looking for. I like that. That's great. So my tip of the week um, is um, expanding upon something that we discussed two weeks ago on last week's episode. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about how if you want to enter symbols, such as the paragraph symbol or the section symbol, one yeah. way you can do it is you can use the text replacement feature. Right. And I was right. thinking about this again this week because um, John Gruber at Daring Fireball uh -huh. was describing a problem that I also experienced on my iPhone where I noticed that if I was like in the messages app, if I was going to send you a text message and say, you know, I will see you in 20 minutes. When I typed 20 to zero, my iPhone automatically replaced it to 2.0. 
I'm like, what the oh. heck is this? I don't know if that happened to you, Brett, but it was absolutely. I don't think I've had that. And but, I'm like, oh, what? that would be so I mean, frustrating. It was, like, <laughs> it was one of those things that happened so infrequently that I never took the time to figure it out. But right, it right. happened enough that it aggravated me. And so what John Gruber figured out is going it happened on to John is too. <laughs> if you have an app that had 2.0 in the title of the app, but he doesn't say what the app was. And I don't know on my own system, but if I, let's just say I have a, an app called, you know, widget, widget 2.0, that right. because the 2.0 is part of the title, oh, what I'm that. typing, Apple is guessing, oh, well, Jeff's typing 20, but it's far more likely that what he's intending to type is the 2.0 portion <laughs> of that app title, which parenthetically is idiotic, but that's right, what's going agreed. on. So how do you stop it from doing that? And so he uses a, a trick, which I've been doing for years. And so this is my tip of the day is okay. text replacement being used um, to change the dictionary. So if you open up the settings uh, yes, app yes, on your iPhone, okay. so right. settings, and then you go to general, and then you yes. go to keyboard, and then you go to text replacement. So it's pretty deep in there. But once you get there, settings, general, oh, yeah. keyboard, text replacement, you right. will see that you can say it that every time I type X, I want you to replace it with Y. And you know the traditional way to do that is for shortcuts. Like for example, one that I use because mm -hmm. I sometimes will do time entry as a lawyer on my iPhone, a phrase that I might use all the time is for example, if I'm, if I'm reading your letter, I would say review correspondence from Mr. Bernie regarding the right. lawsuit. Um, right. But I don't wanna have to type all those words. And so on my iPhone, every time I type RCF, which are three letters that I would normally never use, right. um, it automatically changes RCF to review correspondence from. So it's a quick oh, way for nice. me to enter something. Okay. That's the intended purpose of text replacements. But right. you can also use it for adding something to the dictionary. So in this 2.0, for example, if you say every time I type 2.0, I want you to replace it with two zero, which is exactly the same thing. Right. What you are in effect doing is you are teaching the iPhone or iPad that th add this to your dictionary. It's oh, not unlike yeah. if you're in a Microsoft okay. Word document and it says that some word is misspelled and you're like, no, no, that's not, that's not misspelled. That's actually how this company uses its name. You know, the company Flickr does not have an E its name. So, you know, F-L-I-C-K-R, right. that's that, that is the word. That's not a misspelling. Oh, add that yeah. to your okay. dictionary. This is the same idea. And so- John uh, Gruber suggests using it to solve the, the 2.0 thing. I've used it for many other reasons. I, I, here's just a sample of yes, ones that I yes. actually use in my iPhone. <laughs> Sometime when I am texting or typing an email and I'm exacerbated, I say the word jish. Now, I don't know that jish is, is really in the English language. And, and I only knew because I looked it up before. That was a J podcast. or a G? That's okay. the question. You can do it either way. Oh, and Okay. I've always done it with the J, but every time I did it, my iPhone would not recognize it. It would try to correct it. So I said, look, I want every time that I type J E E S H, replace it with J E E S H. And that way now it's part of the iPhone's okay. dictionary. So it won't okay. change it something else. There's a local theater we have in New Orleans where it's like where all the fancy, you know, Broadway, uh, off Broadway shows are and stuff like that called the right. Sanger theater pronounced s i mean spelled s-a-e-n-g-e-r oh, uh, my iphone always had trouble unusual. with that and tried right. to change it so right. I, I added that um another one as a lawyer as an appellate lawyer i often um do something that in louisiana we call a writ w-r-i-t yes. and every time i did that my iphone would think that i was trying to type right and, right. I, and I left exactly. off the e and I don't want to be texting, you know, or emailing a client and saying, I'm going to be filing the right next week because that would be right. wrong. No, no, no. So yeah. it would not be right. Yeah. So um, I said, every time I type writ, replace it with writ. And then the last one, and oh, you've heard me mention this before when you and I have done presentations together, but for some reason, when I'm typing my wife's name, which is Tina, my iPhone would sometimes replace it with Tona, T-O-N-A, oh, which makes no sense really? to me because who would ever no. want to say Tona? That makes no sense. No one ever says Tona. And so what I did is I said, every time I typed, <laughs> if you think I typed Tona, T-O-N-A, just go ahead and change it to Tina. Yeah, just do and Tina. <laughs> that, that, that was, that, I mean, that was more of a true text replacement. I'm, I'm not really adding it to the dictionary. What I'm saying is my big fat thumbs sometime type something that you think is T-O-N-A, but I was actually trying to do T-I-N-A. So go ahead and fix that. So those are examples of using text replacement. Um, so it's a very powerful feature for what it's intended to yeah. do, which is take something short and make it longer. But it's also a very powerful way to correct autocorrect problems. So that's I, the tip. I, I, I think the big takeaway is the is the writ. I mean, there are several words, whether it's because it's a proper name or, you know, like a like you talked about your theater or something that's very unusual. Like I want it to, quote, be misspelled. 
<laughs> Mr. <laughs> or Mrs. iPhone. Like the writ example, I think is good. I never thought of it kind of using it almost in, in a backwards way. Like, no, if I mistype writ, which is the correct way, yeah, I don't want right. I want it right. to be writ. Okay. In, I like that. Okay. Now I'm thinking of it kind of in that way. Like it is a way that I can confirm that I do want to spell it in this way, which you, Mr. and Mrs. iPhone, may not believe is the correct way, but it is. And I want exactly. it that way. Jeesh, exactly. what are you doing here? <laughs> Jeesh, indeed. Jeesh. <laughs> I love it. All right, Jeff. It has been a pleasure, my friend, this whole year. And I am looking forward to next year. So uh, if everything goes correct and everything goes fine, I will see you next week. Thanks, Brett. Uh, Happy New Year's. And for everybody listening, thanks for listening in 2021. We look forward to listening to talking to y'all in 2022. Absolutely. Happy New Year.